Hello, welcome to OSWAR Gamer. I'm your host, Rob. I'm joined by the Twitch chat, and we have just got the new OCR Bone Reapers book uh, from Games Workshop for 2023. Pretty excited about reviewing the book. It's the first time that I've read through the book, and I'm reading through it with the Twitch chat. Hope you guys enjoyed the review. If you enjoy it, then obviously make sure you share it with your friends, leave comments and likes and other things. Quite excited about the OCR Bone Reapers book because it had some problems going into Age of Sigma 3 in that you couldn't use command abilities and you couldn't use some other things. So I'm really looking forward to this book. It's got a great miniature range. Really, really exciting. So I hope it's really good. So we're going to look at the, uh, the battle traits first. That's the first bit we're going to look at. So what about traits? If you build only an OCR Bone Reapers army, so all the models from OCR Bone Reapers, then you get battle traits for your army. You also get to pick a sub-faction for free, and these are all rules that you just get for free for building your army. So let's talk about what you get. You get ranks unbroken by descent, which means none of your units ever suffer from battle shock, which means you don't ever have to worry about how many models you lose, which is quite fun. You can build big big bricks of Mortec Guard. Um, you normally would have probably a quite high bravery anyway, but I guess it's a nice thing you never have to worry about. You just plow on, which is quite good. Uh, also means um, uh, that you can't even be affected by things that uh, would trigger Battleshock tests to be taken, which is quite interesting as well. So you never have to take one. Good start. Uh, Deathless Warriors is a 6 plus ward save for everyone. So everyone has a 6 up ward save, which is after you've rolled your armor saves, you then would work out how much damage something did. So if it's a damage 1 weapon, obviously it would do 1. If it's damage 2, it would be 2. So in that situation, you would roll 1 6 up ward save against the damage 1, but 2 6 up ward saves against the damage 2 after you'd rolled the armor saves. So 6 up ward save is nice. It adds 1 6th onto the army. It's a little bit different on the math, but there you go. Uh, and then you've got, and there is a way to improve this already. We know that there's a command ability to turn this into a five up ward save, which is great, really good. Netherite weapons mean uh, that any melee attacks that you make, other than mounts, so horses, get exploding sixes. Exploding sixes are when you roll any sixes to hit, then you get to roll two wound dice as opposed to one. So if I roll any. For every six, I get to roll two wound dice. Really easy. That's what an exploding six is. Only works in melee, so fighting close combat, and it doesn't affect shooting, and it works for everyone apart from mounted units. Perfect. Right, next one is Relentless Discipline. Uh, no, it turns out mounts don't have nadrite hoofs for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, right, so then we've got Relentless Discipline. This way you get a lot of command points. This is actually pretty comical. It feels like Games Workshop actually are kind of like almost sticking a middle finger up to the community at this point because what they're saying is by the way you used to not be able to use generic command abilities at all now how does it feel if you have a million command points so if you have three or more units you get an extra command point if you have five or more units you get two extra command points and if you have seven or more units you get three extra command points and what does this mean and when do you get them so it says when you get your starting command points at the beginning of every battle round you're issued with starting command points which is if you're going second it's two and if you're going first it's one it's at that point you add your additional command points onto your army and this is fantastic especially because they have a whole bunch of new command abilities which are very very strong so they can use the generic command abilities now like rally all out defense which is plus one save all out attack which is uh, plus one to hit uh, which is really good. Redeploy, which is always very funny that they could never do it because you would ask them all the time. And also reroll charges, which is quite important for an army that had a lot of charging, especially when you could get within three inches, which is as close as you can get in the movement phase. Then your opponent could issue a redeploy. And if they rolled a six, you went from a three inch charge, pretty statistically likely, to a nine inch charge, statistically unlikely. And then you could you weren't able to reroll the charge. So like you were double worse at movement and combat, which was the main shtick of your army. Uh, but now that's all gone away, so massively effective for OCR Bone Reapers and a real nice change. And they've got loads of command points to boot to make that happen. So, nice. Okay. So then you get command... Uh, OCR commands. They're called... Yeah, OCR commands. That's what they do. So there's special command abilities only, only are usable by the OCR Bone Reapers. And they're absolutely brilliant. And they break a couple of the core rules. Number one, exclusively says in OCR commands that you can use other command abilities now, which is great. We love that. That's really, really cool. 
However, it does say that unlike normal command abilities, for instance, you can't normally do rally twice in a turn, OCR commands you can do more than once in each phase. So that's really cool. A unit still can't benefit from more than one command ability in a turn. So I can't do two command abilities on a unit in the hero phase. Uh, sorry, in the combat phase, let's say. But I can do two of the same command abilities to different units, which is super important. Uh, like, sort of, it's just a really important like clarification that we think about. Okay, so. Uh, what do they do? So reform ranks is retreat and charge. And you can do this on multiple units. Retreat and charge is brilliant. So tactile, it's great in an objective-based game. It's great in a game where you're required to do battle tactics and other stuff. Retreat and charge for reform ranks. Next up, unstoppable advance. Add three inches to the movement characteristic of a unit. Um, they're, sorry, they're all in important points. So this is the movement phase. Uh, Unstoppable Advance is in uh, the movement phase as well. So add three inches to move. That's really good because uh, again, right, move three inches, uh, charge. You can't do them both at the same time, um, but you can uh, do retreat and charge, make another unit move three inches, uh, do a big charge. It's just great. Faster is always better. Renit construction is actually very stealth good. It's one of those ones that you read it and you think meh, but actually really, really powerful. You return D3 uh, wounds to a OCR Bone Reapers unit as long as it's outside of three inches of uh, an enemy unit. So can't be locked in combat and you return D3. Now this is obviously quite useful and it's up to D3 wounds worth of stuff. So like D3 Mortec Guard is a really good example. Uh, can go back into a unit. But the one I really like and why I really like it is being able to heal heroes and characters. D3 is pretty powerful especially in conjunction with the heroic action um, to heal as well. So 2d3 potentially, I think is really good. And it's the end of, but it's at the end of your movement phase. So it's not only in your turn, but I still think that's really good because uh, over the course of a battle round, so two player turns, two heroic actions, uh, you can heal up to 3d3 to a single hero, which means they're going to be very survivable, which is really good. Um, uh, so then you've got uh, Counter Strike, which is if you are if a unit charges your unit, then you get to give them plus one to wound, and this happens in the enemy charge phase, which means in your combat phase you'll still be able to give them all out attack. So plus one, so all out attack and plus one to wound all at the same time, or plus one defense, so or, like all out defense and plus one to wound from Counter Strike. And don't forget you can do this on multiple different units, which is incredibly good. Like, very, very effective. So, just really, really solid. Um, then you've got uh, impenetrable ranks, uh, which is you get to add plus one to the ward rolls uh, when a unit is picked to be the target of an attack. And this is the same as you would do for all-out defense. So, now you've got a choice between all-out defense, which is plus one save to your armor save, and uh, plus one to your ward save. And I know you're going to ask yourself, hey, Rob, what's the difference? Probably... Your units will have a four-up armor save because it's uh, OCR Bone Reapers. So all-out defense is very good if they've got no rend. But if they do have really high rend, then you're going to want to pick the ward save. So that's the difference between the two. The fact that you've got the choice and you can do it multiple times. There are a couple of versions of ward saves in this book where you think, oh, I'll stack it with that, like Nagash. Me and the chat had a conversation about this a minute ago. You can't do it because you can only add plus one to ward rolls for the purposes of the Deathless Warriors battle trait, which we talked about a moment ago. So Deathless Warriors is a battle trait for playing the army, and then you use a command ability to give it plus one to that. So six up to a five up save. Uh, Bludgeon improves the rend characteristic of melee units uh, until the end of that phase. It's pretty good in the right situation. Plus one rend is great. Uh, it really depends. But what I love about this suite of abilities is the utility. You as the player are making a lot of choices as a general, which kind of fits in really nicely with the OCR Bone Reapers lore. Uh, so love that. And then you've got unflinching coordination, uh, which is the final one, uh, which basically means a hero and a unit can fight at the same time. However, you can't chain activate it, it says in the designer's notes, where a hero can activate and then another hero can activate, which it would be a just a problem really uh so this is i don't really care much about this but this is fine and might you might find this being in the right situation uh that you might have a cat across fighting and then you might want another unit to fight at the same time which actually would be quite good so overall 
uh, for what we would call battle traits or its its allegiance abilities, its suite of allegiance abilities, you've actually got a lot of utility and a lot of choice. Some of the earlier battle traits seem a bit plain, uh, like having exploding sixes um, and a ward save, but it does make me feel like it's an army that really wants to be involved in fighting versus a shooting army, which is good because it only really has one shooting uh, piece. Uh, so yeah, like I quite like these. I think these are really good, very tactile. I think you'll be able to do a lot of really interesting stuff. And it also, it gives a lot of decision-making to the player, which is a bonus and makes books better, more engaging, and more fun. What none of these do so far is they really strip your opponent's abilities f um, from being able to have fun, like don't reduce how many attacks they get or uh, make them minus to hit. So it just buffs your guys and makes them stronger, which is normally more engaging than shutting your opponent down. So overall, I think these are great, nice changes, good abilities, real positive. Next up, we're going to talk about the sub-factions. So once you've uh, got your Osiak Bone Reaper's army, you obviously have all the battle traits for free, and then you get to choose one of the sub-factions. So we're going to start off with Mortis Praetorians, which used to be the kind of lead one that Catacross is from. This is once per turn during the enemy charge phase. After an enemy unit finishes the charge move, you can pick one friendly Mortis Praetorian unit that's within 12 inches of that enemy unit, but more than 3 inches away. So effectively, once the enemy is charged, but... Um, and it's not at the end of the charge phase, so it could be the first turn they've charged, which is very, very interesting, especially now that you can do redeploy and you've also got retreat and charges. But the first turn that they, the first time they charge, or whenever, because it's during the enemy charge phase, um, when the enemy unit finishes a charge move, you pick one friendly Mortis Praetorian unit within 12 inches, and then as long as they're not in combat, they can charge. Absolutely massive. Um, this is uh, this is maybe not as good as like Iron Sons, who can do it like up to three times for Iron Jaws, but it is very good for an army that, as we've discussed, probably wants to be combating and fighting a lot. So this is really really good, and uh, you're going to be charging uh, units your opponent isn't going to expect. So this is really really strong. Uh, Petrifex Elite is very interesting, depending on how the War Scrolls shape out which is subtract one from the damage inflicted to each successful attack that targets a friendly Petrifex Elite Hecatos or Petrifex Elite Gothazar Harvester unit. So you reduce the damage from one, uh, sorry, from two down to damage one, or from three down to damage two, but you can never go from damage one down to damage zero. So it always has to go to at least damage one. And the units that this affects are Immortus Guard, which are a tanky unit, um, Necropolis Stalkers, which are an offensive blender unit, and then Morgast Archai and Morgast Harbingers, which are kind of weird, semi-monstrous cavalry fighting units that have never really worked or made much sense as a unit anyway. Uh, but that doesn't mean people haven't used them, and they're incredibly cool models. So this could be very good for them because it really ups their defensiveness, especially when you can give units a 5-up ward save as well, and then you reduce damage by 1. That's pretty massive. So that's really, really good. Uh, the next one is Staliart Lords. You can reroll charge rolls for friendly Staliart uni Lord units that have a mount. Probably throw that one in the bin. And then you've got Ivory Host, uh, which is add one to the number of hits scored by Nadrite weapons. Uh, so that's going to be melee weapons that aren't mounts or horse. Like, they aren't mounts specifically, not just horses, um, uh, because there are some other mounts, specifically the chair. Um, <laughs> but you add one to the number of hits scored by the Nadrite weapons. So these are melee attacks where you roll a six. And it gets become two exploding hits. Now it's going to become three. But you have to have suffered a wound or a mortal wound uh, earlier in that turn. So you're going to be able to do this to yourself via endless spells or potentially mystical scenery if you use mystical scenery. So this is something you don't have to wait for your opponent to do. But it's something you can do as well. The math on it is going to be really interesting. I haven't had time as obviously it's the first time reading it yet to work out the math. That's something we'll do in the future. Uh, but... I really, I really like this, and it's very, very good. Uh, a good point from Ashley Marco in the chat, just for people who might be new. Uh, when we talk about reducing damage down by one, that never applies to mortal wounds. Damage is a different profile to mortal wounds, uh, so that doesn't affect that. So if you're just talking about Petrifex Elite, something to be conscious of. Uh, so yeah, very good. Um, the Exponent Sixes is very interesting. I quite like this. I think that's quite good. I much prefer the damage reduction at the moment that you're going to get from Petrifex Elite. That's my favorite probably so far. Uh, and then you've got Null Myriad, which the chat will say, and is completely fair, this is great uh, for a team's environment uh, where you can 
where teams of Warhammer players will play against each other and you pick uh, who plays who um, because it's quite scary into magic armies. So Nil Mariad, Nil Mariad is um, units wholly within nine inches of a Mortizen or Arcan have a two-up spell ignore and the abilities of endless spells. So you have to be wholly within nine inches, uh, which is very tight around the Mortizen or Arcan. But a two-plus spell ignore is pretty nutty. Um, so that means that you're going to shut down Zinch or Teclis, although they're still going to have a lot of mortal wounds coming out of that army with even without Teclis. But yeah, stopping spell casting is going to be pretty good. Do I think right now that the game is about damaging spell casting meta? The answer would be no, in my personal opinion. Um, uh, the Mortizen is 120 points. Thank you very much, chat. So 240 to be immune to spells. Yes. So you can have two of them and have an aura. Uh, but like while this sounds very strong and very, very powerful, it only really works in the right matchups. Like, Carriage and Overlords don't care that you have a two-up spell ignore. So that's something to be conscious of. Uh, Corn don't care you have a two-up spell ignore. So uh, BC Chaos probably don't care that you've got a two-up spell ignore. Um, so it's really strong, but in the right matchups. Yeah, And it's definitely not something that I would take to a club match. Like, if my friend... If I knew my friend was bringing my Zinch army to a tournament, I wouldn't, not to a tournament, to a, like a club night, I wouldn't then just bring Null Myriad because you don't need to, unless you, you told them, you're like, by the way, I'm going to run Null Myriad, do you fancy that? And they'd be like, oh, it's an interesting challenge. What will I do if I can't do any direct damage spells? But just something to be aware of, right? Uh, and then you've got Crematoriums, which probably my favorite. I've always wanted to paint an OCR Bone Reaper army all full of fire uh, because it's very cool. This is each time a friendly crematorium's model is slain. Before removing that model, you pick an enemy unit within three inches of it and roll a number of dice equal to the wounds characteristic for that model. So if it's one wound, you roll one dice. If it's five wounds, you roll five dice. Uh, for each five plus, the enemy unit suffers a mortal wound. Hashtag murder rolls are back. If you watch the corn review, you'll know what I'm talking about. But hashtag murder rolls, they're back. Um, so potential to do a lot of mortal wounds here. Now, quite different to how Corn will do it. What Corn will do is they'll take a lot of very cheap wounds and then they'll try and stack those murder rolls. In this situation, what you're going to probably do is do a lot of murder rolls on something like Mortec Guard. You have a bunch of them die. And then you've got a lot of healing in this army and you put more models back. So you just keep getting more, more murder rolls, which is quite fun. So it's kind of like a, an exploding skeletal front line. Just imagine a bunch of skeletons running forward, exploding, and then you growing more skeletons behind, which is legitimately very, very fun uh, as a concept. Uh, but whether or not it will work out in practice when we actually like put those lists together in another show, we'll see. But those are the sub-allegiances. My favorite is probably crematoriums. I'm not sure. The best is maybe Petrifex Elite. But Mortis Praetorians is going to be for those people who really understand how to do movement well. So, really good set. Really good set. So, the command traits are the first set of enhancements we're going to look at. Command traits are what your general takes when you build a general in this army. Uh, unique characters. So, Arcan can't use a command trait. Um, uh, so, it can only be like generic characters. Um, and you can only have one command trait in your army unless there are other conditions met, but normally just one. And what are the command traits for this army? Well, they're all great. Well, they're all pretty brilliant. You've got Dark Acolyte, uh, which is for a wizard only. And in the hero phase, um, if this general attempts to cast a spell in that phase, and if it's successfully cast, that spell cannot be unbound. That's huge. That means no one can shut down a particularly strong spell that you might need in that uh, turn. I feel that that's really, really good, but it really depends on just how powerful those spells are going to be. The next one is a uh, show of superiority, and this is where command abilities that your opponent uses um, cost two command points on a 5+. plus. Now, this does require you rolling a 5+, plus, or then rolling a 5+. plus. Um, so I'm going to say that like probably you won't see that make much uh you won't see that a lot in competitive play because it requires you to roll five up, but they are quite uh, important moments like a battle shark or uh, a redeploy. So maybe, maybe to try and really mess with your opponent. Uh, but some of the others are so good that I, I doubt you'll see it. Uh, the next one is means that you can ignore the negative modifier to save rolls for attacks that target this general. This means that rend won't work on your opponent. Uh, sorry, on your general, but things like mystic shield and all out defense will. So you can apply positives not negatives. So you're most likely going to have a general on a two-up save, which is quite nice if that's what you're currently looking for. And then you've got Crafted from Bone Beast. After this general is fought for the first time at the start of each battle round, 
Add one to the attack characteristics of the general's melee weapons for the rest of the battle. This effect is cumulative. Probably won't see that make it into uh, match play or into competitive play. Although really fun for building kind of like a story-based character who goes around just trying to get as many attacks as possible and just yeeting himself at people. The aura of sterility, me and you both, uh, is subtract one from hit rolls and wound rolls for attacks made by melee weapons, I'm sorry, missile weapons, with missile weapons that target friendly OCR Bone Reapers wholly within 12 inches of this general. So, um, minus one to hit and minus one to wound, but you have to be within a bubble around the general it is legitimately quite good. If the army's fairly slow and it's got to move across the board, it's getting shot at, uh, minus one to hit and minus one to wound is legitimate uh, debuffs uh, and it's going to affect all of your army. So, I really like that. I think that's really good. Uh, then probably the best one, in my opinion, is diversionary tactics, which is you subtract three from charge rolls for enemy units that attempt to charge while they're within 12 inches of this general. So that means that your opponent has to roll a minimum of six inches to charge you, um, uh, even if they end up within three inches. So that's really good for your army, especially if you're looking to charge them because you have some charge bonuses, let's say, or you just want to pick your fights in the right situation is also quite nice. Um, I think that one's quite good. I quite like that one a lot. Uh, I'd love to know what the chat think. Uh, but yeah, overall, I think that's my favorite. Let me know what your favorite is in the comments below. Nice. Next up, we're going to look at the artifacts. And we have a bunch for any OCR Bone Reapers here, a hero, and then some only for Mortisons. So the ones for any OCR Bone Reaper hero is the Lord of Saturation, which adds one to ward rolls for the bearer. Obviously, this is going to combine really, really nicely with the heroic action. So you're going to always have, not heroic action, sorry, the command ability. So you're always going to have a four up ward save on a character. Pretty nice, especially if you end up taking the command trait so that there are no negative modifiers to your... Um, to your armor save so you could probably be on a two up armor save four up ward save on a character which is legitimately very survivable then you've got the marrow pact which is each time the bearer fights it gets to heal a number of wounds equal to the wounds it's take uh, it's dealt or mortal wounds it's dealt, dished pretty good especially if you take the command trait so that you can like have more attacks every time you kill a unit or model like i quite like that it's pretty fun um you know kill heal kill heal it's kind of another way of making a very survivable character another one is the mind blade uh, but end of the end of the combat phase in melee if you've dealt any wounds or mortal wounds with the melee weapons uh then the hit to a hero then that enemy hero can no longer do heroic action for the rest of the battle sounds really strong but why not just kill the enemy hero shout out to mb5c for saying that in the chat you got the Helm of Tyranny, which is enemy units cannot receive the Inspiring Presence command ability, so that's where you ignore Battle Shock, while they're within three inches of the bearer. And in addition, if any enemy units fail, Battle Shock test within three inches of the bearer, you add D3 models flee. This will pair really nicely, obviously, with the Horogast and the spell, which means that D 2D3 are going to run away. Um, uh, like, But then you're overlapping the ability to ignore Battle Shock, uh, to not be able to use inspiring presence twice because both of those things will do it but 2d3 is quite interesting and as we've uh someone in the chat's pointed out you're going to be able to get minus three leadership on an enemy unit so you could potentially make a lot of models run away from a unit which is which is really really good bone shaper and the soul reaper and stuff so you've got the luma scythe uh which is you minus one to hit rolls and wound rolls to attacks that target the bearer whilst they're within three inches of the enemy units this is what we would call like a linear buff, as it only affects the singular unit it affects. What you really want is a buff that creates an economy of scale in your army. Artifacts, command traits, and some of the other things in your army are very limited resources that you can add in. So you always want to be multiplying the value you've put into an army, which is units and points, versus, versus just doing something like this, which is keeping a singular character alive. If it turns out the Soul Reaper has the most incredible buff it's available to take, then you just take two. That's the answer, uh, in my opinion. Right, so <laughs> uh, so I don't really like the Luma Scythe. You've got the Artisan's Key, which is for a Bone Shaper, and this is already the pinnacle of a list, So, or the pivot point of a list. Before you use the Bearer's Bone Shape ability, which is effectively either heal a unit or on a three-up, you can return a slain Immortus Guard or... A stalker unit, probably going to be the Immortus Guard, right? On a three plus, you can either pick two units to benefit it, benefit from it, or you can pick 
um, the same unit to benefit from it twice. Now, this is pretty exciting. Now, me and the chat have done some rough, dirty math on it. The Immortus Guard is like 200 points. So if we were to take ourselves two units of nine Immortus Guard, and then if we were to take ourselves three Bone Shapers, we're left with 440 points. But this means, because the Bone Shaper ability doesn't say it can't stack, this means you can pick a unit of nine Immortus Guard, and what you could do is you could potentially... I mean, you have to roll three ups, that's fair. But you can return, uh, potentially return up to four of them um that's right one two three four up to four of them to a unit uh in in your hero phase so that means uh that you can return like 20 wounds which is pretty pretty interesting especially if you take them with the sub faction where you're minusing the damage i really like that down to one so uh, and then you also potentially potentially can give them a five up ward so you've got like a nice set of little combos there thank you to the elder superconductor for subscribing for the first time so very very interesting little combos really like that with the bone shaper uh so do pick yourself up an artisan's key uh you got the bones of the abyss which is for soul mason and each time the bearer successfully casts a spell you add one to the attack's ossified claws now you're really starting to see what i mean about uh buffs in line and uh, economies of scale. The Bones of the Abyss don't really do anything but make a Soul Mason more like damagey and that unless it's like incredible in a fight then the Bone Shaper is always uh, the Artisan's Key for the Bone Shaper is always better and then you've got the Garthazar Cartouche which is you add one to wound rolls for attacks by melee weapons by friendly IUC Art Bone Reapers wholly within 12 inches of the bearer again another economies of scale unit uh, sorry, unit uh, ability. The Oss Effector is the new model from Games Workshop. Uh, it has probably the best artifact, which is unsurprising. You get the new model, give it the best new artifact, make everyone plus one to wound, uh, because uh, traditionally OCR Bone Reapers don't wound particularly well. They normally wound on fours as opposed to threes. Um, and that's huge. That's huge. So probably that's a straight out winner. Really like that. Bone Shaper in second. Okay, this is going to be a magic army. This army's got some incredible casts. It's got Nagash. It's got Arcan. So you've got access to some really great wizards, but do you have some really great spells? Number five will surprise you. Uh, I think I'm really getting this YouTube thing down, I think. Anyway, uh, if you haven't subscribed, by the way, please do subscribe. It says over half of you don't subscribe. <laughs> I don't know why. That just seems so mean. Right, okay. So what spells do you get? Uh, you've got... Uh, so this is for your OCR Bone Reapers uh, wizards. So in Power Naderite Weapons is Castle of Five and a range of 24 inches. And uh, until the start of your next hero phase, the Naderite Weapons ability, which is that you do exploding sixes, uh, goes to exploding fives. Now, you're going to say to yourself, well, Rob, the sub-faction where you can also get them to explode three times, not twice doesn't stack you want it to but it doesn't so it doesn't work that way but it does also already add more damage onto that well more more explosions because you do it on fives so you're going to get two explosions on fives yeah and then i think a, a three on sixes yeah three on sixes right um which is still kind of good in my personal opinion still kind of good i like that i think that that's a cool spell and I think that there's a nice little combo that isn't quite as powerful as you think it's going to be, but it's still really interesting, right? Which I really like. Uh, then you've got the uh, Protection of Nagash, which is changed, which is going to make Owen really mad and actually makes me really happy. So it's a, caster's, a spell that's cast on uh, a six, and you cast it on the caster itself, right? At the end of any phase, if any wounds or mortal wounds were allocated to the caster in that phase from an attack made by a melee weapon and the caster was not slain now that's a change from what it was but specifically it's in any phase so if you do happen to be hit in the melee in the hero phase with some melee weapons for example then what happens is if the, your unit survives you can teleport nine inches away uh, well not nine inches away anywhere on the board but nine inches outside of the enemy and then the spell is like it vanishes, so it's kind of like a like a an auto defense teleport, which is kind of fun. It used to be something you used to be able to trigger yourself, so that you would do a mortal, you do a spell, um, uh, but you you now are like trying to make them fight in other phases, then teleport away, and there'll still be some very interesting gameplay mechanics, especially with uh, retreat and charge, 
um, in there. But the fact it has to be done with a melee weapon means that it's a lot more specific than it was previously. Uh, then you've got Reinforced Constructs, which is cast on a 5 and 18 inches. This gives a unit of OCR Bone Reapers a 4-up ward save against Mortal Wounds. Don't forget, it doesn't stack, so it does not stack with the previous command ability. But... A 4-up ward save is pretty legit against Mortal Wounds, especially when you've also got the other 5-up ward save, um, just generally as a, like an ability anyway. So like this is nice. This is particularly good in the right matchups. Um, then you've got Drain Vitality, uh, which is a, a pick an enemy unit, and then minus 1 to hit and minus 1 to their save rolls within 18 inches. That's really good. Minus 1 to hit's great. Uh, minus 1 to save rolls is really good. I love that. Then you've got Mortal Contract. This is a very interesting one. It's 18 inches and it's 7. And you pick a unit. And then for the rest of the battle, any time that they do any damage to your army, or your OCR Bone Reapers specifically, um, then on a 3+, plus they suffer D3 Mortal Wounds. So that's kind of interesting. I would really like that to work. I feel like that's one of those spells that you just cast because that's the last cast you've got and you're going to cast it. Um... But yeah, you could potentially, yeah, like Marathi is a good example. But like, you would want something that does something to you in almost every phase. So like, Archeon's a good example, uh, where he's going to try and, like, he doesn't, he does have a shooting attack, I think. But like, you want something that wants to shoot you, that wants to fight you. Uh, and every time that they do damage to you in any phase, um, and it has to be on a t with attacks, they take mortal wounds. But ultimately, like, uh, oh no, it is on attacks only though. So it is only on attacks and spells aren't attacks. So that's important to point out. And then you finally got Soul Release, uh, which is um, uh, Kessler. I can't remember what it is. But basically what it does is it stops units from being able to set up within 12 inches of you from reserve. So you cast it on the caster. And then if anyone wants to set up from reserve outside of 12 inches, uh, sorry, they have to set up outside of 12 inches. So they can't get within 9 inches, can't get within 3 inches, right? And that is so, so good. I absolutely love this. Anti-deep strike tech is awesome. So, so good. Um, like, it, it, it's going to shut down whole armies, going to shut down whole uh, army archetypes, which is very, very interesting. Like, it's very rare. That's also a really good point in the chat. Like, especially with all those other combos, we already talked about maybe having um, an artifact or a command trait, which means that you can't, that you add plus three inches to charges. So this is just making everything much worse. This is just so good. Yeah, Bulgors hate this one weird trick. Um, great spell. So overall, you've got some really interesting utility in the four uh, board save. Um, you get slightly better output. You get to uh, defend yourself with some minuses to hit and minuses to save. You get to protect the caster. But overall, not like an overwhelming set of uh, spells, but some interesting ones at least. Uh, and that's quite important. Okay, so... We've just done spells, so we're going to move on and talk about endless spells that you can take to kind of, before we look at the War Scrolls, to round off the suite of things that you can do with your army. So there are three endless spells, and they're all absolutely brilliant. So the Soul Stealer Carrion, which I think is 40 points, the chat can correct me on that. Uh, you cast it on um, a six, and you set it up anywhere on the battlefield. Now, each one of your wizards can only cast one of these endless spells because they become bonded. Okay, bonded doesn't really mean anything unless you end up teleporting a character or somehow a character is removed from the field, in which case it vanishes. That's the answer. Um, so the soul steel carrying, and it, but importantly, it's a predator training spell that moves up to eight inches. That's what it does. Now, uh, models uh, is bonded. We've told you about that already. And the important part that this does is it's got an aviarc sentry. Models with a wounds characteristic of one or two that are within six inches. So not units models with an exception one or two within six inches of this endless spell cannot contest objectives but it does not affect it does not affect friendly ocr bone reaper units so absolutely fantastic i think it's 40 points super cheap to just drop on an objective and be like oh you don't control this now uh put your own little monster on there and grab it really really interesting piece of tech into this army which i think is very very good the nightmare predator is actually a pretty strong damage dealing spell uh you set it up within 12 inches and it moves eight inches every unit that it's moved across on a two up takes d3 mortal wounds 
How, and then uh, you choose one unit within one inch of it and roll a final dice. On a one, nothing happens. Two to five, this of D3 mortal wounds. And then on a six plus, D6 mortal wounds. So it's just a flat out and out damage spell. It's got a really funky rule uh, to do with garrisons, which might be an indication of of exactly um, what uh, Age of Sigma 4, 4 might be like with endless spells and garrisons. The last endless spell is the Bone Tithe Shrieker. So you set this up within 12 inches and it moves 8 inches, which is a, an effective range of 20 inches. It affects all units within 12 inches, not wholly within 12 inches, and they cannot receive the rally or inspiring presence. This is massive. No rally for everyone within 12 inches is crazy. And then um, no inspiring presence, so they they are going to take battle shot tests. Is also incredibly good. Doesn't affect your own OCR Bone Reaper units, so you can use rally. You can use it. Well, you don't need to use inspiring presence. You mean, but like phenomenal, right? And you're like, okay, great. But there's more. You just here. This is not a rule. Get ready to lose your minds. Subtract one from ward rolls for units within 12 inches of this endless spell. This ability has no effect on OCR Bone Reapers units. No, nice Nurgle armor you've got there. Same if it was. Shame if it was rubbish. Yeah, where'd you get your Nurgle army? The rubbish army store. Bone Tide Streaker. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it does three incredible things. No rally, no inspiring presence, minus one ward save. Like, it's an auto include in a way that I can't even begin to describe. It's good in every situation, and it's not even <laughs> boom got him. and it's not even wholly within. It's just within. Uh, more like Bowtie got him exactly. So just remember that. Uh, so then final bit of your kind of like allegiance ability suite before we talk about War Scrolls is your faction terrain piece. It's actually massive, um, and it is impassable. So if you don't know much about terrain and you need to learn more, I've written a terrain article on the honestwargamer.com. So honestwargamer.com forward slash terrain. And there I put out a bunch of maps and also like a terrain FAQ. So if you want to play some games at home, you can play with this. Because the Bone Tide Shape, uh, Bone Tide Nexus is a large piece of terrain and you could potentially use it to block your ability to your opponent to even move and attack areas, which is actually a really negative thing that you should never ever do. Like it's not really encouraged by me or anyone else in the gaming community. Instead, you should just be like, oh, I'm going to replace this piece of terrain and make sure there's room to move around it. Otherwise, it becomes really oppressive and really bad. Yeah, in my personal opinion, because it's got that new impassable word. So it's a huge footprint, can't stand on it, can't go near it. Uh, well, you can go near it, but you just can't stand on it. Uh, then finally, what does it do? <laughs> what does it do? It's got this ability called Deadly Gaze. In your hero phase, you can choose for this terrain feature to deliver one of the following punishments. Okay, so in your hero phase, you've got Punishment of Agony. Now, oh, now you've all got a special rule. If any enemy models are slain within 12 inches of the Bone Titan Nexus, then you add plus one to these. So I'm going to say four plus on all of these abilities, but it could be a three plus if any are slain. Okay, so Punishment of Agony is on a four plus subtract one from hit rolls for attacks made by an enemy unit within 18 inches until the next hero phase, right? Until your next hero phase. So it could go over their turn, your turn, their turn, and then double turn before your next hero phase. So it could affect them for three turns, which is massive. You got another one, um, which is pick a unit within 18 inches on a four plus D3 more wounds. That's probably the worst one. You got Punishment of Ignorance, uh, which is pick a wizard or a priest within 18 inches and roll a 4 plus or a 3 plus, of course. Add one to the roll if any, any models were slain within 12 inches. Uh, sorry, uh, you add one. Uh, sorry, you subtract one from the casting rolls and chanting rolls for that unit. So you just minus one to cast or chant, basically. I love that it's called chanting. Wololo! <laughs> I guess it wouldn't be a wololo at that point if you minus one. You'd just be like, wololo! Like that. Not like a whole wololo. You, you'd, you'd lose the last low, I think. And then you've got Punishment of Lethargy, which is whew, amazing, right? So you pick an enemy unit within 18 inches and you subtract three from charge rolls from that unit until your next hero phase. Obviously, this is going to stack, like with the ability that we talked about earlier, to reduce the enemy charges by three to a maximum of... Uh, reduce their charge by six inches, making it so they basically can't charge... That's a phenomenal ability. 
Really, really effective. Absolutely love that. Uh, so overall, the terrain piece gives you a lot of really good buffs um, in being able to hurt your enemy and shut them down a bit. So yeah, 11 out of 10. Like really good, really good. Uh, Endless Spell is incredible. Endless Spell is incredible. Terrain piece, I'm going to say incredible. Yeah, really good. Okay, on to Big Popper K. Or as some people in the chat have described him, three bone shapers in a trench coat. I know what you're asking yourself, Rob. What the hell? Well, we'll get into it. Let's talk about his profile to start with, though. He moves four inches, which is slow. Very, very slow. But don't forget, you've got that command ability to move an additional three inches. You could also just run him as well uh, if you want, but there isn't so far a run and charge. Uh, so move four, move seven, move up the board. He's got 20 wounds. Huge, huge amount of wounds. On a 3-up armor save, which when we get to in a minute, can very easily be a 2-up armor save. A lot of healing in this army as well. So, it's huge. Okay? Now, his close combat profile um, is actually improved on his previous version. And the more he's wounded, the more attacks he does with his Indicat and the Shield of Mortis. Because what happens is all the retinue kind of die around him. And then he steps forward and he starts slapping some fools. And he can end up with four attacks, damage three, and another four attacks, damage two. Which is legit and pretty good. Yeah, on threes and threes with Ren three and Ren two. So he's he's legit really good. Uh, he isn't locked into Mortis Praetorian. Uh, he does have the Mortis Praetorian keywords. And you can see that just here at the bottom of the war scroll. Uh, that's the important part. But you can still use him in other sub-factions. So not locked. It cannot, can't only be taken in Mortis Praetorians, right? Um, so that's something to know. Okay, so he's also got a ton of abilities. He costs 440 points, and he is mad good. Mad good. So number one, he's a War Master, but only if he's in the Mortis Praetorian army, he's treated as a general. Okay? That's important. Yeah? Really easy. So he's only going to be a War Master, therefore the general, in a Mortis Praetorian's army. That's the first bit. Uh, all of his retinue are counted as companions, um, and they have the retinue blades, and those retinue blades are counted as Nadarite weapons. Uh, so that applies to them. Then he's got a bunch of incredibly powerful abilities. He's got the Prime Necrophos. Once per turn, this unit can issue a command to a friendly OCR Bone Reapers anywhere on the board. This is great without a command point being spent. And as we know, we've got a great set of command abilities to use. So he can do all sorts. If there's a unit trapped in a corner, he can just be like, you over there, you can retreat and charge. Don't worry about the command point. This one's on me. He high fives and says that. Right. Really good, Prime Necrophus. That's good. Then you've got the Gnosis Scroll Bearer. At the start of the hero phase, you can pick one enemy unit. Uh, on the battlefield until your next hero phase, subtract one from hit rolls for attacks made by that unit until uh, the, uh, that target friendly OCR Bone Reaper units. Okay, until your next hero phase. Let me tell you, this is insane, especially with the terrain piece. We're now picking two units or the same unit to have minus one to hit on it. So either the so he's definitely doing it, doesn't need to roll a dice, and then the terrain piece is picking another piece another unit within 18 inches or the same unit so you could never give them so even if you give them plus one to hit it'll never cancel out the plus two oh the minus two sorry so that's pretty crazy or just minus one for you minus one for you cast the spell from the spell law another minus one that's crazy efficiency and the fact that he just picks uh one enemy unit anywhere on the battlefield is nuts especially as it can affect shooting uh just really good yeah, really, really good. Uh, okay, so then we've got the Aviarch Spymaster. Once per turn, you can roll a dice when your opponent receives a command point. If you do so on a 5+, plus command point is lost. Incredible. Incredible. Like, it's not very efficient, but sometimes it's going to become super key. Then you've got the Do Nothing, This One's Mine. If you are fighting a hero, are you within three inches of any enemy heroes, you get to use the bottom profile or the more, like, fighty profile of Catacross's profile, which is pretty good, which means even if he's fighting a hero, he's going to get to do all of his big attacks because Catacross steps off his dice and fights them. Really awesome. Uh, and then you've got the Mortark and the Necropolis. So this is very much like how the Bone Shaper works. And this is, effectively, you heal a unit uh, up to three models. So three... Um, uh, uh, but it's only one wound models, so that would be your Mortec Guard, so three of those. Yeah, or if it's Immortus Guard or Necropolis Stalkers, on a 3+, plus, 
you return a slain model. But you can choose up to three different units. You can never pick the same unit three times, but you can pick three different units. So if you've got three units of 10 Mortec and you want to return some from those, you can be like, yep, yeah, bosh, bosh, bosh. And it's three, not a D3, just a flat three. So one, two, three, which is really cool. Uh, really, really fun. If you'd had three units of Immortus Guard, you could like roll a three plus for each one of those and try to return one, which is also awesome in my personal opinion. So really, really good. This is why he's kind of like three bone shapers in a trench coat. Love that. That's great. He can also heal himself. Thank you, Tobias, in the chat. That's a good thing to point out, especially as then can do heroic action as well for another heal. Uh, so he's going to be very, very tanky, very survivable. Then he has two command abilities, and they're both done at the same time. So you can't do both of them in the same hero phase. They're both done in the hero phase. So you've got to choose one or the other. One of them, the Supreme Lord of the Bone Reaper Legions, has to be done if he's not in combat. So he has to be outside of three inches of the enemy. And you can use his command ability in the hero phase. The unit, uh, so he basically receives the command himself. And then... Friendly OCR Bone Reaper units and not keyword lock to his faction, any, generically, get plus one save and plus one to hit, wholly within 24 inches. So, if he's in the middle of the army, every Bone Reaper unit within 24 inches, plus one to hit and plus one save, is insane. Thank you for your service. Oh, thanks to Dad Bod and Abgod for donating £20 to the show. That's great, right in the middle of the YouTube recording. Love that. Thank you so much. So his other one, Endless Duty, is you pick a um, uh, he, you pick an OCR Bone Reaper unit and they get plus one to their attack's characteristic, which is also hilarious. Like, plus one attack on some of those units is really good. I feel like you're going to do you're going to do uh, the plus one to hit and then plus one save as many times as possible uh, because it just makes your army so incredibly powerful, especially when you combine that with Mystic Shield, especially when you combine that with the ability to give them a five-up ward save. is very, very good. Then you've got lots of healing in this army, so it's going to be tougher to kill. Um, and it's going to be maybe impossible to charge. You're going to be minus to hit. They're going to be plus to save. They're going to be uh, doing Mystic Shield and all-out defense as well. This is an incredible unit. Like, 440 points is great. Absolutely great. About, what if I say this? It's 440 points, and you can give your entire army all-out attack and Mystic Shield, and your opponent can't stop you. That's the way to describe it. And he slaps people in a fight. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10, Crack Across. Uh, the next unit we're going to look at is Arkan the Black, the Bone Daddy Breather himself. He is a wizard monster with some amazing utility. He's got 14 wounds on a 3-up armor save, which means he gained plus 3 wounds and plus 1 to his save in this update, which is absolutely huge. Standing next to Catacross, he's going to be on a 2-up armor save. Don't forget, he's got a 6-up ward save naturally, thanks to the battle trait, and can have a 5-up uh, mortal wound save. Oh, sorry, 5-up ward save. Could technically have a four-up mortal wound save, actually, if he really wanted. So Arkham the Black, very, very tanky and survivable. Uh, he's 370 points. Let's get on to his abilities. The first thing we should probably talk about is the fact that he also has the same uh, ability to uh, res units and put units on the board as um, Catacross, so the Mortark of Sacrament. So he can heal up to three units, three wounds each, or... Three units uh, can return st uh, to Mortis Guard or Stalkers can return them on three ups. So that's in there. So And he can heal himself. So now 14 wounds and can heal himself. Three wounds, pretty great. Heroic action, another D3. We'll talk about his survivability even more. We'll talk about Feast of Souls, right? Each time this unit, after all of its attacks have been resolved, you can heal, heal up to a number of wounds allocated to this unit equal to the number of wounds of Mortal Wounds caused by those attacks with that allocated to enemy units up to a maximum of six so each combat phase potentially healing six each hero phase definitely healing three and maybe heroic action healing d3 uh trying to deal with him at range uh he has a five at ward save uh if he wants to and also he has that two up armor save so he's legit um, like, incredibly legit. 370 points can have the same survivability profile as a Frostlord on Stonehorn, can heal three times as well as a Frostlord on Stonehorn, can cast three spells, which is one more than Lord of Change, 
for 370 points, which is less than a lot of change. Um, gets plus two to those casts, thanks to his special uh, s uh, stick, the Staff of Spikes. Um, and then you've got the Fist of the Mortark, which is you add six inches to the range of spells cast by friendly Death Wizards that are wholly within 18 inches of this unit, including himself. Why is this important? Well, he can do a Mystic Shield at 18 inches, which is quite nice. I quite like that. I think that's really good. But also he can do the Realm spell in the current General's Handbook, which is normally 12 inches. That's now going to be 18 inches. Pick an objective 18 inches away absolutely nuke that objective everyone in range of that takes d6 spot wounds which is what the realm spell is at the moment which is very very strong um as for his own war scroll spell he's got Cur curse of years where you roll 10 dice any sixes or a mortal wound you take those successful uh sixes and you roll them again if any of those are fives then you roll and it's a four then a three then a two then a one you got to make sure you're always rolling successes and carry those dice across uh, ones are always a fail. Ones will never work. So eventually you'll just run out. But you can get it on two ups and just keep rolling them until you roll any ones. Um, it's not ever really great until it does happen and then it's absolutely insane. Pretty good spell, in my opinion. Uh, he can fly. Uh, he's very, very mobile. Should have mentioned that, sorry. He moves uh, 16 inches, uh, which so it's very, very fast. Um, uh, that's 10 more dice slot change. <laughs> he's really, he's not too bad in a combat with uh, six attacks uh, with his Evan Claw mount on fours and threes, Ren two, damage two. Don't forget if he's next to Cat Cross, it's actually going to be threes uh, and threes, Ren two, damage two. If there's a character nearby with that plus one to wound aura, then it's going to be threes and twos, Ren two, damage two. So very likely to be able to heal himself back up after he's done a bunch of damage, which is very good. So, um, that's everything. He's a War Master as well, so he's going to be doing command abilities from 18 inches, not 12 inches. Will always count as a general, which is really, really good. And that's... E oh, uh, yeah, and that's absolutely everything for this guy. This guy is stacked. Cat across in this guy is pretty crazy. It's going to be 810 points. Um, how can you heal him? You can heal him with the Mortark of Sacrament ability, the Feast of Souls ability, uh, and you can also uh, heal him with... Um, uh, the heroic action so huge amounts of heals so incredibly survivable huge amount of heals incredible spell casting extend spell ranges incredibly well uh, not too bad in a fight very survivable 11 out of 10 11 out of 10 so good next we're going to be talking about uh mir kanan who was originally one of the underworld's war bands so mir kanan and mir kanan's lads uh although uh here which is a unit of five they're called kanan's reapers rocking 270 points kanan's reapers are two wounds with a four up armor save uh they can bodyguard for mir kanan uh, which is what this Dark Efficiency rule is. Uh, they've also got uh, the Tithe Reapers, so each one in this unit counts as three for the purposes of holding objective. So that unit of five is going to count as 15 for holding objectives, which is pretty, pretty great. But Mir Kanan himself has got eight wounds on a three-up armor save, only moves five inches, and it's bravery 10. He's got a pretty decent axe. He's got five attacks, threes and threes, Ren 2, damage 2. Absolute smashing, which is really good. Uh, he's 250, sorry, 250 points. Okay, so what does Mir Kanan do? Well, he's got like this kind of really unique ability called the Bone Tithe, which is the only example we've actually seen of the narrative of the Oshar Bone Reapers, which is that they collect kind of like, they're like tax collectors, but for bones, so they can build more bone soldiers. That's their, that's their whole shtick. Um, if you slay any models uh, with, um, with, Mir, Mir, sorry, with Mir Kanan, um, then you get to add one to your your bone tithe score. And at the start of your hero phase, if this unit has a tithe score of one or more, you can reduce the tithe score by one. And if you do so, pick one of the following abilities. You either get built for war, which is you pick one friendly Kanan's Reaper unit and you heal three slain models into that unit. So that's going to be three of those five back and they're two wounds each, which is really good. Or invigorated and you add plus one attack to all of their attacks which is super cool. But the thing that's probably going to cause a bit of an internet storm and definitely needs an, an FAQ is the Dire Ultimatum spell that Mir Kanan has because Mir Kanan's also a wizard. So Dire Ultimatum is a spell that has a casting value of four and a range of three inches. If successfully cast, pick one enemy unit within range 
and visible to the caster. Until your next hero phase, any attacks made with melee weapons by that unit must target this unit. The range of this spell must be measured from the caster, even if an ability would allow you to measure it from somewhere else. Okay, so that means that you can't cast it from a spell portal, right? Which is a nice bit of writing, so that they organise that. Unfortunately for Games Workshop, though, they've also included a wizard in this army called Arkan the Black. And Arkan can extend spell ranges by 6 inches. This becomes problematic because this means that he can cast his spell from 9 inches away, which is outside of combat. It's very much clearly, or well, I say clearly because that's always a problem in wargaming, it looks like it might be tried to be uh, written so that you only do that when you're in combat. So it's like, you can only target target me, I'm doing a big taunt kind of spell, so you only focus your attacks on me. Unfortunately though, uh, being able to do it from 9 inches away means that you can pick a unit and say you can only do your melee attacks against me, but I'm not in combat with you, and therefore you can't strike my unit that's hitting you in the face. Which is a kind of like uh, interesting taunt, uh, very much like tanking in World of Warcraft or something like that, which is quite fun. I really hope that this ends up getting FAQ'd, otherwise it's actually quite problematic um, in a lot of different ways. Um, you could also cast this spell, I guess, if you really want it in the hero phase while you're in combat, and then you retreat out uh, in the uh, hero phase uh, so that you still can't be targeted, uh, and therefore they can only fight you. I really think this needs some clarity, but right now it's very funny, uh, very funny. If I'm doing it with your mates, just don't do it. That's probably the easy answer, but it might get FAQ'd. We all thought that uh, the Wind Spirits for Lumineth Realm Lords were never going to get the FAQ that they got, and they got it, so pretty interesting. So shout out to Mick Kanan and the boys. Right now, hot property. Will the FAQ change that? Let's find out. One of the other characters, named characters that you get inside... Uh, Mortis Praetorian, so going alongside our dear and wonderful Mr. Catacross, is the Arch Cavalos Xantos. Uh, he's got seven wounds with a three-up armor save, and he moves ten inches, so he's, he's fast enough. He's got the Dark Lance, which is five attacks, threes, threes, rend two, damage two. Uh, on the charge, that becomes damage three. So, uh, more powerful than a Bloodthirster's Axe. Just pointing that out there for all the Corn Bros that want to leave horrible messages in the comments. Um... Obviously, he's got Exploding Six as well. He's a War Master in Mortis Praetorian, so uh, nice extend, extended command ability range. Uh, he's mounted. Uh, he's got once per turn, he can issue a command to a friendly OCR bone room unit without a command point being spent, which is great. Um, he's got Unstoppable Charge, which is an Ogre Charge, which is you roll the number of dice that he's charged, and on our fight, and then every five up out of those dice becomes a mortal wound. So you roll 10 dice. You roll a 10 inch charge, you roll 10 dice, five ups, mortal wound. So he's an Ogre. Um, you got add one to the damage characteristic, and then he's got still their breath, which is uh, you can use command ability in the combat phase, and then until uh, this unit must receive the command, and until your next hero phase, you add one to wound rolls for friendly mortis praetorian units while they're wholly within 12 inches, which is pretty great. Plus one to wound. There are other ways to get plus one to wound, but that's definitely a very good one. Only works in mortis praetorian sub faction, which is obviously charge in your opponent's charge phase, so that's quite interesting. Quite like him, pretty good, pretty survivable. If you took him with Catacross, he'd be on a two-up armor save. Um, he's decent in a fight. Probably not for me, though, but still great. Okay, so the next uh, named character is Vok Martian, Master of the Bone Tithe. So he's like the tax collector for the OCR Bone Reapers. He's also in Mortis Praetorians, okay? Although you could include him in other armies if you wish to. So... What does he do? Well, he's a two-cast wizard, and he's 140 points. I should point that out. He's quite slow, moves five inches. Um, has got a four-up save, so isn't very survivable in this book, although near Catacross it would be a three-up armor save. Can have a five-up ward save, so actually that's very survivable. Um, can heal a million wounds. Uh, has got six wounds. Uh, his Don't worry about his shooting or his combat. That's not what he's there for. He's a two-cast wizard. Pretty incredible for 140 points. He knows all of the spells from the law of uh, Bone Reapers. Also incredible. A two-cast law master, that's what we call someone who knows all the spells. Nuts, right? Absolutely nuts. So that's already incredibly good for 140 points. But then what else does he do? Okay, so he's got the Contract of Nagash, which is at the start of the combat phase. You can pick one enemy within three inches of this unit, roll a dice. On a three plus, your opponent must spend a command point to be able to target um, this unit. 
in the uh, enemy unit's next attacks in that phase, which is pretty crazy. So in the combat phase, you've got to spend a command point on a three up to attack Vort Bartian. So that already gives him a bit of defense. Grim Warnings, like that's already very, very cool. Very, very cool. Especially if you use the uh, command trait we talked about earlier, where you make it so that someone has to spend more command points on a 5+. plus. If you're taking Cat across and he's stolen a command point on a 5+, plus, there's a lot of dice rolls to make that stuff happen. But dice rolls are really fun in uh, Age of Sigmar and all wargaming because it creates stories on the battlefield. That's the point. Then you've got Grim Warnings as an ability, which is subtract two from the bravery characteristic of enemy units while they're within 12 inches of this unit. If the model picked to be the enemy general has been slain, minus three. This will tie in really nicely with um, the D3 more units run away uh, that we talked about earlier um, in, from the command traits, I think. And then also with the plus D3 run away from the generic and the spell uh, Horogast. So you can make an enemy unit minus three bravery and have 2d3 of them run away from a battle shot because they won't be able to use Inspiring Presence because of the uh, either the ability or uh, the end of spell. And then you're like, okay, that's incredible for 140 points. Well, what if I was to tell you this guy can defeat God himself or Archeon or other gods if you want. Uh, Nagash maybe. Um, Mortal Touch is a spell that's cast on seven and it's got a range of a singular inch. If successfully cast, pick one enemy model with a range visible to the caster and roll a dice. On a 4+, plus, that model is slain. The range of this spell cannot be modified and must be measured from the caster, even if the ability would allow you to measure it from somewhere else. So pretty interesting. Uh, uh, no, you can't kill Marathi because any instant slay abilities like Gargants and Marathi, uh, Gotrek, all have rules on their war scroll that tell you that you can't instant slay some of those. Um, uh, so, but most big models, not most big models, not all big models, will be killable via this process, and that's awesome. Especially if you do uh, the combo we talked about earlier with Mir Kanan, make it so a unit can't fight, uh, charge Vault Martian in, wait a turn. Cast a spell, roll a four up. Goodbye, my lovely. Right? Just everyone go home. High fives all around. You just leave the tournament that day. You say no more. You pack up your miniatures. Shake hands with your opponent. No one ever knows your name. Close your lid. Just go home. Never go to Warhammer tournaments again. You've defeated Warhammer at that point. I'm proud of you. That's all you needed to do. Well done to you. Fort Martin, 140 points. Absolutely 11 out of 10. The next unit is the Mortis and Soul Reaper. It's 120 points, and it always reminds me of that song by the Bare Naked Ladies. Uh, he's got five wounds on a four-up armor save, and his bravery 10. Now, honestly, for 120 points, there's not really much to say about the Mortis and Soul Reaper. There's a wizard, which is legit. Uh, there are better wizards already in this book, though. It's quite a fighty wizard with three attacks, and with the Soul Reaper ability, if you target a unit with five or more models, you can go up to five attacks. Threes and threes, Ren two, damage two. There's ways to get plus one to hit there's ways to get plus one to wound and you can even do flaming weapons and be like five attacks twos and twos ren two damage three he's also got a spell which does d3 mortal wounds or three mortal wounds at some point in the game but it, with an army that needs loads of overlapping buffs and isn't really lacking for casters this is one of those casters that really doesn't do anything he doesn't improve synergy improve really the gameplay um and just doesn't really bring that much to the table so i'm going to skip the soul reaper our next unit is a generic caster now. Uh, not generic caster, sorry. Is a generic hero, which means you can take command traits and you can take artifacts. It's the Liege Cavalos. Round of applause, please. Seven wounds with a three-up armor save moves 10 inches. Uh, he's an okay melee combatant with five attacks at damage two and six attacks at damage one. I'm going to say he's okay. He's got the ability to, once per turn, this unit... Uh, can issue a command to a friendly OCR Bone Reapers unit without a command point being spent. Very useful, especially with all those incredibly useful command abilities. He's got Unstoppable Charge, which is the Ogre Charge, which happens on five ups, so same as Xantos. But he does have a unique command ability called Endless Duty, where this unit receives, um, he can issue a command ability and you pick a friendly OCR Bone Reapers unit in range. Uh, if he's a normal hero, it's going to be 12 inches. If he's your general, it'll be 18 inches. And until the next hero phase, you can add one to the attack characteristic of that unit's melee weapons. This is obviously fantastic um, uh, because you can do this and then also do cat across his ability for plus one to hit and also plus one save. So then you're not missing out on being able to do endless duty, which is quite nice. Um, 
a steep price, 180 points for being able to bring this in. You really got to ask yourself, is it not just better to have another unit of, let's say, 10 more tech guard, like versus the Leech Cavalos, who've got more attacks. Uh, but maybe in the right setup, you want to get a unit with plus one to hit, plus one to wound, plus one attack, get that all layered up on a unit so it can just do a ton of extra damage. But this army feels like an army that's going to die, resurrect, die, resurrect, and is going to be a very heavily attrition-based army. Uh, so I'm not sure I would necessarily would want to what we call spike damage uh, by trying to overlap those buffs to achieve that, uh, especially at 180 points, when I feel that could be utilized in other places. But still, can definitely take a great command trait, can uh, take a great artifact, so might be worth looking at for that because he's very survivable at seven wounds with three up save. The next unit is the new miniature, the Mortison Ossifector, and is 120 points. Thank you. Uh, he's got five wounds with a four up save, moves five inches, so a little bit slow. He's a wizard, can cast a spell, but for 120 points, that's a bargain. His spell has a range of 24 inches and it's got a casting value of five. And it lets him choose up to three different Harvesters, Mortec Crawlers, or Morgasts to use for, with his Refined Creations ability. So effectively, he kind of buffs himself. Because normally, he can only pick one. So he's like, he stands there and he goes, right, I'm going to pick three. So he casts his spell. And then his Refined Creations ability allows you to pick a Gothasar Harvester, Mortec Crawler, or Morgast. And you can give him one of these buffs. So uh, what you can do is you can use Ossified Barbs, which improves the Ren characteristics of that unit's melee weapons by one which is really nice, as we already, we already know that there's another way to add plus one rend. So now that's rend two. Uh, that's from a command ability. I think it's bludgeon. Thank you for Greg in the chat. Uh, you've got accelerated calcification, which is the first wound or mortal wound caused, by the, to, caused to that unit in each phase is negated. This is kind of okay. Maybe something, I, I don't think this is particularly good. Then you've got enhanced claw span, which you do on a missile weapon. So this is going to be on your uh, Mortec crawlers, which you're... Um, your uh, catapult pieces uh, and then this gives them exploding sixes so they generate two hit dice instead of uh, two wound dice for every six to hit which is pretty good uh, so overall feels very very good maybe we've talked a lot about like catacross and archon but if it, uh, if it are yeah arcan uh, but it feels like you maybe take an Oss Effector and then you have a couple of Harvesters or you have a couple of Crawlers and then you're just buffing them all up individually uh, to be much more potent at range, which is pretty fun. So uh, the Oss Effector looking very, very good. So for 120 points, you can also get the Mortison Bone Shaper. Five wounds with a four-up armor save and moves five inches. Uh, it's got an okay melee profile, but again, that's not what he's there for. He's a wizard. Uh, and a generic wizard who can take a bunch of different artifacts. Don't forget, you've got the one artifact that allows him to use his Bone Shaper ability twice, which is very good. This allows you to return up to D3 models, uh, sorry, up to three wounds allocated to a unit, so basically return three um, Mortec Guard, or do that twice, or to two different units, uh, or return Necropolis Stalkers or a Maltese Guard, which is legit very cool. So some very strong healing with an artifact to do even more strong healing, and then he's got a special unique spell, which is Castle of Five, and a range of 18 inches. And you roll a dice for every model in the unit, the enemy unit, and then every five up is a mortal wound. So we call this a horde clearing spell. Uh, so a load of utility here, as well as obviously being able to choose a spell from the spell law. Uh, so that mortars and sh bone shaper, shaping up to be really good. That is, he's, he's good. He's good. Okay. The mortars and soul mason is 160 points. This maybe got one of the best hats in all of Age of Sigmar. He's got six wounds with a four-up save and moves five inches. The Bone Pope, as he's also known, is a two-cast wizard, and he's also a lore master, and therefore knows all of the spells. He's got a mount, which is a chair, so he can't be a Galician champion. And he has a couple of abilities. Specifically, um, he has uh, a spell called Soul Guide, which is a spell that has a range of 6 inches and a ra sorry, a casting value of 6 and a range of 24 inches. You pick Mortec Guard and a Cavalos Death or a Cavalos Death Rider unit, and you can add one to wound rolls to attacks made by melee weapons. Now, he's got something called the Mortec Throne, and at the end of your hero phase, roll a dice for this unit, and on a 1, nothing happens. On a 2 to 5, this unit can immediately attempt to cast Soul Guide, um... And if you roll a six, you can do it D3 times. So this does mean, if you want to, you can cast two different spells with the Soul Mason. 
Then you can roll a dice with the Mortex Throne, and then you can try to cast Soul, Gra Soul Guide, and if you roll a six, you can do D3. So you can have five casts from the Mortis and Soul Mason if you get this right, which is pretty good. The plus one to wound, though, is only going to affect Mortec Guard and Kavalos Death Riders. And while those units are obviously good, this means it's got limited utility in list building because you're only going to work on it if you're maybe building big bricks for Mortec Guard, which is quite interesting. So the Soul Mason is a very interesting piece. I'm not sure I'm definitely going to take him, but it's very cool and it would work really well if you're taking lots of Mortec Guard. Okay, on to the basic battle line. This is the troops that you're finally going to buff up with all the buffs we've been talking about with all of the heroes. So Mortec Guard, here they are. They come in units of 10. They have a banner bearer, get its plus one to run and plus one charge rolls, which is really nice. They've got one wound each with a four up armor save and bravery 10, and they move four inches. So you're going to get 10 wounds on a four up save for 150 points, which is quite pricey for 10 wounds. Um, they've got a champion who has a special um, uh, plus one attack to one of his two weapon profiles. And you either have a Naderite Blade or you have a Naderite Spear. Don't forget those exploding attacks. But they've got a pretty lackluster profile. Two attacks each uh, with the blade or the spear. And they're either threes and fours or fours and fours. So not great. But you can get, don't forget, many pluses to hit and pluses to wound. So you can probably be down to like twos and threes with a Naderite Blade, and then threes and threes with a Naderite Spears. Naderite Spears have got slightly longer range, which is really nice. Um, you do have an ability called Shield War, which uh, means you do in the combat phase, it's a command ability, and you can ignore the positives and negative modifiers to your save rolls. Um, so this is quite interesting. If you get hit with a really high rend damage attack, uh, then it might be just worth doing shield wall. In loads of other situations, especially if you've got like cat across around, uh, then it makes sense to do plus one save um, and then maybe do something like a mystic shield on a unit and then use the five up ward save ability is another way of thinking about it. Uh, but it really does, uh, yeah, it really does depend on the matchup and what you have charging at you and fighting you. But very awesomely, you get to pick and it gives you more options as the OCR Bone Reaper player. I will say, though, that the output on the Mortec Guard isn't particularly stellar. You can add plus one to rend to it with the uh, command ability as well for that, which is cool. Um, yeah, like so that's quite fun. There are ways to add plus one attack on as well. There's plus one to wound, plus one to hit. So you can really stack a load of buffs on the Mortec Guard, but they're quite pricey to stack all those buffs on, especially when you're bringing very expensive heroes to stack those buffs. So, Mortec Guard, quite an interesting place. Not sure about them so far. But yeah, there we go. Mortec Guard, your battleline unit. This next unit is the Kavalos Death Riders. And they're 170 points for a unit of five. Feels quite expensive, but then you find out that they're three wounds each. So that's 15 wounds. They move 10, they've got a four up armor save. They have a standard bearer, which gives them plus one to hit. Uh, sorry, uh, plus one to run and charge rolls. Champion who is the Mortec Hecatos, who adds one to his attack characteristic, uh, and obviously they're mounted. Now, they've got a couple of abilities, which is the Unstoppable Charge, which gives them the Ogre Charge, so whatever the dice result is for your charge roll, let's say it's a 10, you roll 10 dice, any 5-ups will do a Mortal Wound, uh, and then when they do that, they get to then pile in an additional 3 inches. This is quite important, because their Death Rider Wedge Command ability lets them, pile, lets them travel over units um, that have three wounds or less. So you can charge in and then you can move up to six inches and you can move over units that have got uh, a characteristic of three or less. But what are they like as a combat unit? Well, it's kind of interesting, very much like the Mortec Guard. They have a bunch of stackable buffs, but there's going to be like a fine point where you get everything exactly right. If you, for instance, have Catagross, they're already going to have a three-up armor save, and they could potentially have a five-up ward save. So that already means a very survivable 15 wounds. Um, think of something like a Frostal and Stonehorn. It'll be as difficult to remove these. But you can also heal a lot into them as well. They're three wounds each, which means Catagross can put one back each turn. Arcan could put another one back. So you could potentially heal three units of Death Riders, uh, up to two models or six wounds uh, in each of your hero phases, which is pretty significant, um, which I think is really good. Uh, then you've got um, two weapon profiles. You've got the Naderite Blade and the Naderite Spear. So there definitely can be 
very tanky. They can also attrition really well and will be what we call a brawler unit if they're not more on the defensive side because they can heal a lot. So they've got three attacks with a Naderite Blade and three attacks with a Naderite Spear. Um, and then the Hooves and Teeth have two attacks. Now the important point to note is that you can get plus one uh, to wound from something like the Soul Mason, but there are loads of options for getting plus one to wound. Plus one to hit uh, from Catacross is already going to take a load of these attacks to hit on twos and wound on threes. Then being able to use the Command Ability Bludgeon so that you get plus one rend. Um, and then also if they've you've cast a spell on an enemy unit so that they're minus one save from your spell law, you potentially are pseudo up to Ren 3. Same applies to Mortec Guard. A lot of attacks at Ren 3 hitting quite well. You can also make it so they have exploding uh, exploding Naderite weapons on 5s as well as 6s. Or maybe even be in a sub-faction where it's going to happen 3 times on a 6. It's quite interesting. So you could put a load of attacks out, which, be thanks to all of the other overlapping buffs you've got in your army, mean that they're actually at a very high Ren value as well. Really interesting couple of units. Feels like that they're very, very weak on paper. But actually, when you start to discuss all the things that is possible to do to make them really elevated, a unit of five is looking at doing some significant damage. Before you even talk about the fact that you've got the retreat, uh, sorry, the command ability for retreat and charge. So they're not necessarily ever even locked into combat as well. So retreat in, uh, uh, sorry, charge in, do mortal wounds, do a bunch of attacks at a very high rend value, retreat out heal a bunch of them in, recharge them in. Feels quite good. They're quite expensive, uh, but I think there's some real play here, which is quite interesting. Right, we're getting to the spicy part of the book. The powerhouse, the Gothazar Harvester. 210 points, 10 wounds on a 4-up armor save, and moves 6 inches. Is very good in combat, with 6 attacks at damage 2, and then two more attack uh, sorry, 4 more attacks at damage 2. You can use the command ability plus also the Ossa Factor to increase the rend on this to insane numbers. I think you can easily get up to rend 4 on the Soul Cleaver attacks. It's got 4 up armor save, but of course, if you're near Catacross or even just took a Misty Shield on him, it's going to be a 3 up. And of course, you can use the 5 up ward save on him as well. So Gotham's a Harvester can be very, very tanky. But what does he do, Rob? It's a great question. He's got this ability called Bone Harvester. How does it work? If any slain models within six inches, if any models are slain within six inches, and this used to be friendly, but is now, or maybe it was never friendly, like, but any models, and it's six inches, not three inches, any models are slain, then you roll a dice on a four up. If it's a one wound model, you heal one wound or return one wound to an OCR Bone Reaper unit within six inches of this model, including itself. Okay, pretty simple, right? So a Mortec Guard dies then you would roll, uh, within six inches of the Gothasar Harvester, you would roll a f dice on a four-up, you would then return a model to a another unit um, uh, within six inches, right? And then put it down. You're like, okay, pretty simple. But it's also enemy units. So if you're Mortec Guard, for instance, kill a bunch of dudes in front of them, then you could heal up the Mortec Guard near you, another hero nearby, another unit, as long as they're within six inches, which is really really great so it's effectively like having a perma four up rally on a unit of mortec guard there's some other little interactions which are also really fun as well when you do remove a model uh, damage attacks and everything are all done simultaneously but removing models is done individually uh, so removing a model individually means you remove model roll a four up and then potentially replace that model back so it's effectively like a four up ward in many ways but after your five up ward save um, and then also, if your opponent then removes some models, it becomes super fun. Really, really fun in something like Praetor um, uh, sorry, the fire faction, so that you can explode, five ups, do mortal wounds, and then return more tech guard back to the unit is uh, really, really cool. It is a monster, so you will be able to do uh, monstrous actions. Uh, so let me just show you there. It is a monster, so you're able to do monstrous actions, which is really good. So you can do things like roar or stomp, uh, which is going to help as well. Um, it also has exploding weapons, which is great. You can potentially make it have exploding weapons on a five. So legitimately an incredibly powerful combat monster if you want him to be. Uh, a huge healing buff piece uh, for the rest of an army, which is also really strong as well. In an army that already does loads of heals. Problem is you've got so many of these now, you're not sure where you're going to get them from. But 210 points feels very good for the Gothasar Harvester. Incredible stuff, yeah? 
so, so, so good. Okay, so coming in at 200 points is a unit that was always very unique in the OCR Bone Reapers catalogue and has now changed up and is still unique and very, very interesting. Very interesting. 12 wounds with a 4-up armor save and moves 4 inches. It is a artillery piece, which means you can only take 4 of them. Uh, you find out the word keyword artillery in the pitch battle profiles in the point section, not at the bottom of the war scroll where it says war machine, which doesn't really mean much, to be honest. Okay, it's got three different weapon profiles when it wants to shoot and when it wants to target a unit. And it does have an ability where um, once it's shot a unit on a 5+, plus, it will have the strike last effect in combat. But if all of your shots targeted that unit, then uh, it's going to be on a 3+, plus, which is pretty nice. Um, so, uh, the Dread Catapult has got um, one shot at 36 inches, twos and threes, Ren 2 damage D3 plus 3. So pretty nice, pretty nice. Um, uh, I guess it's comparable to an Iron Blaster, but an Iron Blaster has two shots, but doesn't hit as reliably. Uh, the Necrotic Skulls has only 24 inch range, four shots, threes and threes, Rend 1 damage 2. Don't forget, we can improve the Rend of these uh, thanks... Um, uh, we can improve the render of these thanks to the Osser Factor, uh, which is okay. And then you've got 2d6 shots, which will average out of 7. 3s and 3s, no rend damage too. All in all, it feels like the damage, which used to be the kind of point of the Mortec Crawler, has gone away. And instead, you're replaced with the ability to potentially make stuff strike last. Which is interesting in a book uh, that's got some debuffs now as we've read through them. Uh, but is a very heavy brawler unit anyway. Like, we've got a lot of heals, we've got a lot of saves, we've got a lot of special uh, ways for getting wards and other stuff. So it feels like an army that's already doing okay. Strike Last doesn't necessarily help it out tons because it doesn't have a fragile front line. It's got a very aggressive front line. So maybe there's some lists where you take multiples of these. Right now, uh, I'm not 100% certain if I'm sold on it, which is a bit of a shame because it's such an incredibly iconic piece, but I don't think it's necessarily going to make it into uh, games. But we'll see. I'd love to know what you think. Let me know. Okay, on to an incredibly elite unit, but an exciting unit is the Immortus Guard. They are 200 points, and you get five wounds on a three apart armor save, and they move five inches. Don't forget, obviously, you can do all the classic things like move an extra three inches, retreat and charge. Give them exploding sixes on their melee profile. Make it so... We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so it's 15 wounds, because it's a unit of three, on a three-up armor save. Sweet. They're very survivable. Six-up ward base can be a five-up ward with a command ability. Can be a four-up ward against mortal wounds. So already very survivable. Near Catacross, they automatically get plus one to their save. They could do all-out defense and Mystic Shield, so they could be on a two-up save ignoring Ren 2 with a five-up ward save. Your opponent uh, takes minus one to hit from Catacross and the Bone Tire Shaper engine, and they're minus two to hit these bad boys as well. What I'm saying is they're going to survive some stuff in the right setup. Sometimes maybe not, sometimes definitely, right? But they're 200 points, which feels really legit because of their armor save. Like, really, really good. So uh, they've got three attacks each in close combat. Threes and threes, Ren 2, damage 2. Now we know we can get extra attacks in here. We can get plus one to hit and plus one to wound. So we could easily have 12 attacks, twos and twos, Ren 2, damage 2. We could make that Ren 3 uh, if we use Bludgeon, but then we couldn't use their special ability, Crushing Assault, which is a command ability that once per battle, you can fight twice with this unit. Um, but you can use the spell from the OCR Bone Reaper Law and make it so the enemy unit has minus one save. So you can pseudo get them to rent three, which is pretty interesting. Damage two is not as high as you maybe would like, but they are in the ultra defensive unit and they spike. They could spike some pretty nice damage with exploding sixes, exploding fives, if you get the spell off on them, which is pretty nice. Uh, but that's kind of like weirdly like an amazing unit until you get to what they do with the bodyguard rule, which is that they can bodyguard OCR Bone Reaper units. Oh, they can also be battle line if you take a Mortars and Hero. So they can be a battle line unit and can you buff them up to a unit of nine. Uh, but they get to bodyguard units, which basically means they get to pass off wounds from some of the smaller characters onto these guys, which is very effective. We also know that Catacross and Bone Shapers and uh, Arcan can pick these units and they can potentially on three ups return a base. I think we can get it up to, if we were to work really hard at it, uh, you could potentially get it up to returning three or four 
uh, to a single unit of a Mortis Guard in a turn before you've even ever rolled a Rally, uh, which is interesting. Obviously, correct order, Rally first. You can only ever get two back now with a new Rally command ability, and then you would try and roll the rest. Uh, so, incredibly defensive, um, pretty fighty, which is quite nice, especially with a fight twice, um, and then able to heal and resurrect them. Uh, these are everything Colonel Thunters wishes, wish they were, with more buffs than Colonel Thunters can get, and Colonel Thunters cost more, um, and so these are brilliant. These are absolutely brilliant, in my opinion. Okay, so the next unit, the other kit that you would build if you weren't building a Mortis Guard, is the Necropolis Stalkers. And where the Immortus Guard are fighty, these guys do more damage. Five wounds on a four-up save, and they move six inches. They are a unit of three, so 15 wounds. Uh, they have, uh, in a unit of three, two of them will take Spirit Blades, and one of them is allowed to take the Dread Falchion. So if you have a unit of six, it'll be four and two. The Spirit Blades are four attacks each. Threes and threes, Ren two damage one. And uh, the Dread Falchions are 3 attacks, 3s and 3s, rent 2 damage 2. But at the start of each combat phase, you can choose a Quadrac Aspect. And this is add 1 to hit rolls for attacks made by this unit. So you can choose one of these abilities. Add 1 to save rolls for attacks that target this unit. Add 1 to wound rolls for attacks by this unit. And add 1 to the damage characteristic. Now, probably when you're getting charged, you're going to always choose the defensive one. But uh, most of the time, you're going to want to be using the plus 1 damage characteristic ability. Which would mean you've got... Eight attacks at damage two and three attacks at damage three. Don't forget you've got all those other buffs you can stack on, like we talked about before. Exploding sixes, exploding fives, um, plus one to hit, plus one to wound. Additional rend as well, uh, because you don't have any hero phase, com uh, sorry, command abilities in the com uh, combat phase to do. And that's when bludgeon will be done. Uh, you could potentially have these guys up to rend four. Um, or pseudo Ren 4, Ren 3, but also reduce the save of the enemy down by 1, um, which would be, uh, I mean, you could do a purple sun and that would be Ren 5 if you really wanted to, which is obviously stupid, but available. Um, and then they've got Hunt and Kill. You can use this command ability uh, in your hero phase, and it gives them run and charge. They move 6 inches, so um, a run move being different to a normal move means you can add an, a, an additional 6 inches as well. That's 12 inches, and then charge 2d6, pretty tasty love that uh so then you end up with a uh, a big slammy fighty unit now the output of this is much much better than the mortis guard yeah absolute hammers they're gonna just delete stuff my worry is my worry is that they might not necessarily survive well enough they're 20 points more than the immortus guard um you can obviously return slain models this unit like you can with the immortus guard um, but I think it's going to be a real question. Maybe a nice mixture of both. Maybe a six and a six and a six. Uh, really make it so your opponent is struggling and working out what to do. Um, uh, obviously, if you're stacking buffs on units or you're applying lots of buffs on units, you always want to find the most um, um, attacks or the most things that you can do on a single unit. Um, so you want to maybe take a unit 6 or a unit 9 so you can stack a ton of buffs on. Uh, but there'll be a, like a, a perfect point which you'll really be able to work out um, by just playtesting. I would say though for me I feel like I really enjoy the Immortus Guard just because they're so difficult to remove. I think that that feels really, really positive. But I think that there's definitely a really strong argument for the Necropolis Stalkers which is also brilliant. You can get them up to rent 4 or it's nuts. So very, very good. Really fun units, super elite. They've got even a sub-faction that applies to them, so you reduce damage by one, which is really cool. Yeah, I really like these. These are really interesting. So our last units that we're looking at are the Morgast Archai and the Morgast Harbingers. And they're effectively identical units. They've even got exactly the same points, 240 points. As a profile, uh, and you get a unit of two. As a profile, they've got six wounds each. That's 12 wounds across for the unit. And they've got four up armor save. They move 10 inches, and they're bravery 10. They can also be equipped with the same weapons, uh, either Spirit Halberds and Spirit Swords. The Spirit Halberd is, I think, quite clearly better because it's three attacks, threes and threes, Ren 2, damage 3. But you can buff up the number of attacks to four attacks uh, and you can make it hit on uh, twos, wound on twos, and be Ren 3, damage 3. So that's just very, very good. That's 12 damage per guy, potentially 24 damage out of the unit, which is pretty nutty. Uh, which is really good. And they've got some really nice tech to them. So some uh, really good abilities. They've got the Heralds of the Accursed One, which enemy units cannot receive commands while they're within three inches of any friendly uh, units with this ability. That's really good. Especially 
into other OCR Bone Reaper armies, uh, hilariously. They've got Grim Opponents. Uh, if you make an unmodified charge roll of an 8+, uh, just stealing that from Corn there, uh, then you get Always Strikes First. Don't know why they've stolen from Corn, um, uh, but there you go. Um, strike First, which is quite good for these guys. I guess they're a little bit squishy uh, on that 4-up save, although, of course, they obviously can have a 3-up save and ignore Rend with all save stacking. And then you've got Necromantic Custodians if you take the Archai. Um, and this gives them a 5-up ward save while they're 12 inches of any friendly OCR Bone Reapers. They've also got like a pretty big wound pool of 6 wounds. So with a 3-up armor, well, 4-up base, but like with pluses to the armor save and a 5-up ward save, they should survive a fair amount of damage. Um, the other version of them is uh, the Harbingers, and they just get the ability to go into Deep Strike. So for the points, the 5-up ward save one is significantly better and is the one that you would take. I guess what you have to really compare these two is the two previous units, the Stalkers and the Immortus Guard. And while these guys are uh, faster, although in the case of the Stalkers, you've got Run and Charge, not as fast as those. Um, these guys can hit very hard, but I think the Stalkers can generally hit harder and the Immortus Guard can survive more. These guys fit in a really interesting spot where maybe you would take a unit of two for that um, ability to shut down command abilities. But overall, um, you can give... You can't return slain models of these. You can give five up wards to the other models. So even though I think these models are absolutely awesome, I'm not certain they really make it into the list for me personally. Uh, but they're still very cool. And you definitely, they're not terrible. They're just maybe not as good as the other units. The final piece of the puzzle is how you are going to score points. And this is Grand Strategies and Battle Tactics. These are the, There are the generic ones that you can always find in your battle pack located in the General's Handbook. However, however, these are the ones for your book. Now, you've got Demands of the Tide. These are Grand Strategies. You choose one on your army list when you write a list. You've got the Scale is Balanced. When the battle ends, you complete this Grand Strategy. If any friendly Mortec Guard or Kavalos Death Rider units from your starting army have the same number of models as they have at the start of the battle. Pretty good. Especially with just the sheer volume of healing and retention that we see in the army. But a little bit risky. What if someone wipes them all out? If you're going very heavy on the Mortex and Gothas are Harvesters, you'd probably be fine. Textbook Conquest. When the battle ends, you complete this grand strategy if you control all the objectives on the battlefield. This is what we call a win more uh, objective. So if you control more stuff, if you're winning the game already, then this just means you double win the game. So this is kind of risky, especially if you're in one of those tight claims. Then you've got Creation and Termination. When the battle ends, you complete this Grand Strategy if there are more friendly Mortisons than enemy heroes on the battlefield. You have to take a lot of Mortisons. You have to guarantee you're going to kill those characters. Army compositions being what they are. You're playing against corn. You might never get to any of them. Don't choose that. Then you've got the Pride of Ossia. When this battle ends, you complete this Grand Strategy. You've completed this, at least four battle tactics. And every battle tactic you completed is from the list below. Let's see if it's worth it. The battle tactics are Trample the Defiant. Uh, which is you pick a friendly Liege, Liege Kavalos Death Rider unit that's not currently in combat. You get it in combat, and then it has to be in combat at the end, and you get two victory points. The Sculptor's Entourage is you must have a, a Mortis Guard unit and a Mortisan contesting the same objective. That's pretty good, but that's really based on how your army is composed. You've got Remorseless Bombardment, where you kill an enemy unit with a Mortec Crawler. Not sure you're going to see a lot of Mortec Crawlers, but obviously if you do, that one's available to you. The Tide Demands, which is you pick one enemy hero in the monster, uh, one enemy hero mo or monster on the battlefield, and you complete the tactic for Gothazar Harvester have wiped him out, which you, you probably can do because those things slap like hell. Then you've got the Edge of Obliteration, which is you have two friendly Necropolis Stalk units, wholly within enemy territory, but more than nine inches from one enemy units, which is kind of weird because they're a combat unit you want to be in combat. So maybe something that happens more towards the end of the battle. So I'm going to go for no. On that one, but you know, maybe. Then you've got Unfeeling Recursion, where you use the Renit Construction uh, Command Ability three times on three different uh, friendly Bone Reaper units, um, and they have no model slain uh, in this turn. So that kind of feels like an odd one where you need three units to um, be her and then you need to return some models which is an odd one so this is kind of an interesting point because even though we've discussed what is quite a strong book you get to the point where they score points the battle tactics and the grand strategies and some of that isn't necessarily super easy they've got a couple in there like the death riders one but that requires you to take death riders 
You got the Immortus Guard one, but that requires you to take Immortus Guard and Immortison. Uh, you got the Stalkers one, but those Stalkers can't fight. Uh, so overall, actually, not necessarily super easy to score points. So that kind of like really like tops the end of the book off in what seems to be a really, really strong book. Loads of cool abilities, loads of unique abilities, uh, a very grindy, uh, defensive, but also fighty combat force. Uh, the the spellcasting is very strong with access to all of the spells almost all of the time. Loads of very cheap, competent wizards. Uh, you have a lot of very powerful debuffs, lots of minuses to hit with some very good armor saves. Feels like so many of the units feel like auto include that you're going to really fight for the different builds. Love the idea of uh, Mortec Guard units blowing up with Gothstar Harvesters returning them. I like the idea of Arcan and Catacross fighting together and doing all the shenanigans they're going to pull. You've got loads of healing, and then you've got all the sub factions. Are you going to make it so that you're just great in a team event where the 2 plus spell ignore is going to come into effect all the time? Are you going to make it so you Necropolis Stalkers? Um, a minus one damage all the time, which is also very good, in my opinion. Are you going to go crazy and try and get as many exploding attacks on an incredibly buffed up unit that you can get in the other sub-faction? So just loads, loads of really uh, uh, interesting builds in there, lots of different key pieces, and the, the shape of the army will change quite significantly. I'd say that it feels like it's quite expensive points-wise, but when you see just how much recursion i.e healing you've got in the book it's significantly powerful like very very good you have to obviously watch out for units that are going to just wipe whole units of yours off the board but i don't see how that's going to be possible all the time because you're very defensive with five at wards minuses to hit and some other stuff incredible stuff great book and i loved it thanks to the twitch chat for hanging out with me today while we did this uh, it's been a real pleasure. I uh, can't thank you enough. If you have liked the video um, and you think it's worth uh, supporting me as a creator, um, you can subscribe on Twitch or you can join up to my Patreon. We get exclusive you get exclusive STLs and uh, interviews and other stuff, and it would absolutely make me feel incredible if you did so because then I would end up um, being able to do this more and better for a living, which is kind of my goal. So I hope you enjoyed this, and thanks very much. Loads of love, and I hope you have loads of fun playing your OC fun. <laughs> loads of fun playing your OC up, Bone Reapers.